I too want to welcome you to the service this morning. It's good to see you. Hope everyone's doing well and hope you'll enjoy the service today. Boy, we're, our attendance is really down today in Sunday school and worship. But we're so thankful that you're here and we want to remember those that are traveling and those that are going on vacation. I know that we have several families that are gone this weekend and so let's remember them in our prayers. But if you're visiting with us today, it is certainly a, a privilege and pleasure for us to have you visit with us here at Pleasant Hill today, and we trust that you will enjoy worshiping with us this morning. If you would please do us a favor and look in the back of the pew in front of you, and you'll find a visitor's card. If you would please take just a moment to fill the card out and place it in the offering plate, and we'd appreciate you doing that. Now, let me um, mention that today is Memorial uh, We're celebrating Memorial Day this weekend, or observing Memorial Day this weekend, and I want to thank... Um, uh, Irene Covered and those who helped her with the decorations and all today and certainly want to remember all of those who have served in our military and those that are serving, those that have given their lives for the freedom in which we enjoy today and those who continue to, to die in harm's way uh, for our freedom. And so let's be sure and remember them. Remember our troops that are on the field today and pray for them. Uh, let me mention a few announcements uh, this morning. Uh, first of all, Tonight is a very important uh, night for us, and I, I just hope and pray we have a good crowd. Let me encourage everyone, whether you're a member or non-member, let me just encourage you to be back tonight. Be here and let's have a good crowd. Steve Harrelson will be coming tonight to preach in view of a call as associate pastor in our church. And um, I, if you weren't here this past Wednesday evening, I shared with Brother Eddie uh, Day, who is the chairman of our search committee, our per personnel committee, we shared information about Steve and his family and uh, I've asked Steve if he would to please uh, preface his message tonight with a sort of a, a, a brief life story and so he'll be sharing information about himself and his background and uh, and about his family and so I hope that you will come and hear him uh, I believe that he I've heard him preach I haven't seen him preach but I've heard him preach and I, I think he's a he's a really good pa uh, preacher He's, he's an excellent pastor. We've had, had reports from some of his parishioners as well as people whom, uh, who know him and who have uh, served with him and where he has served, uh, people through the university where he's received his education. Uh, it's just, uh, and we've done a thorough investigation of this guy. We've done all that we can do. And we've talked to him about his doctrinal beliefs. He's written all of those out for us. We've, we've looked at um, his finances. We've looked at everything and everything. We've done background check. We've done the whole ball of wax on this guy. And so we, uh, the committee and I feel that this is the man for the job. And so we just ask that you come tonight and support our church, support one another, support him, he and his family, and make them feel welcome tonight when, they, when he comes to the platform. Let's give him a good round of applause and welcome he and his family. It's, it's a difficult thing, believe me. It's a difficult thing to come into a new church and to uh, you know, anticipate, uh, really not knowing what, what to anticipate. And so uh, please, please pray for them. Uh, so tonight he will be coming and sharing his life story and preaching a message tonight. And then after the service, all the members of this church will have the privilege of casting their vote, either yes or no, for Steve um, Harrelson. So please be here tonight. Then at 5 o'clock, uh, he and myself, he and his family and myself will be meeting with the deacons in Michelle Marley's Sunday School classroom. That will be at 5 o'clock. So I want to encourage the deacons, all the deacons to be present. And then... Um, I wanted to share with you that uh, Kathy and I are leaving uh, this coming week. Uh, we'll be headed to Mississippi. I have a revival there beginning next Sunday morning. And uh, then the, next, the following Saturday, I have a big wedding to do. And so we will be out the next two Sundays. But uh, I've scheduled some guest speakers for you, and I trust that they're going to be a blessing to you. On Sunday morning, uh, June the 2nd, which will be next Sunday, Greg Anderson uh, will be preaching both AM services. Greg is, he and his wife and daughter, they're in our Next Steps program now, uh, hoping to become a member here, desiring to become a member here. And uh, Greg is a missionary and, a, and has been a pastor. And so Greg will be sharing the word of God with you next Sunday morning. And then on uh, that following Wednesday evening, uh, Tim Reed will be speaking. And then the next Sunday, Chris Carter will have all the services. And then on the 12th, our own Mr. Hank Campbell will conduct the service on Wednesday evening. So be in prayer for these guys. 
and pray for me as I go and share the, the word of God with this church. And uh, they're without a pastor right now, and they're really struggling and have been struggling for quite some time. So please pray that God will use me in a mighty way there during that revival meeting. Then on the 29th, uh, which will be on Wednesday night, let me remind you, the, architect, the architects will be back for Q&A, for question and answer period about the, the building project and the master plan. And uh, so I encourage you to be present for that and uh, answer, ask any questions that you would like to ask them. And then on June the 2nd, which will be next Sunday morning, you will be uh, allowed to cast your vote on the master plan. And uh, you'll be receiving some instructions about how to vote. You will vote by secret ballot. Those ballots will be counted, and we'll, we'll find out what you, the church, how God is going to speak through you, the church, and what his will is regarding this master plan project, okay? Um, remember the sick, Brenda Peel, her grandson, Sarah Carter, who's had a knee replacement this week, and Wynnon Collins, who is in intensive care in the hospital in Winston-Salem at the Baptist. So please remember these folks in prayer, okay? I think that takes care of everything. So let's have our welcome time. Would you stand with me, please? And we're going we're gonna to sing this hallelujah, praise the Lamb. If you would, everybody turn around and welcome somebody to the service this morning. standing if you would and let's turn to hymn number 493 as we begin this morning onward christian soldiers number 493 we will do the first second and the last stanzas as our call to worship the words are on the screen and you can use your hymnal uh, I, I think we've got our little technical thing taken care of up there with the words uh, we were kind of iffy at first in the early service but they came through for us so andy chapman's doing a great job up there you put that last line on there. <laughs> Onward, Christian soldiers. Let's sing together. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus going on before Christ the marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before at the sign of triumph Satan's host doth flee on then Christian soldiers on Glory, Lord, and honor unto Christ 
Brother Joe, can you you lead us, please, as we pray? Recognize those who have um, received scholarships this year. We did this in the earlier service uh, this morning for those who were in the early service, and uh, some of you may be in this service, and we certainly do not want to leave anyone out. Um, But as I call your name, if you would, uh, just come down and receive your... Uh, scholarship reward and uh, I will call everyone's name Uh, the ones I think here in the first service were Courtney Wagner and Carrie Stoker CJ Lyons Austin Lyons Donald Gillum the third Corey Cockrum Sidney Carter and uh, the uh, Hutchins award went to this year to Courtney Wagner so as I call your name uh, would you please Uh, come and receive your award and if uh, that student is not here if you are a parent uh, would you please come and and accept this for them first one is mr. Alex Carter I believe he's here Matthew Carter come on up making us old Okay, Bailey Carter. Bailey's not here this morning. Okay, Derek, got it right here. Wendy, are you in the... She's not, okay. Um, Christy Carter. No Christy? Alan? (laughs) You make sure she gets that. All right, and Michaela Evans. And Michelle, you may also come on too. <laughs> All right, and Jonathan Hamlin is not here this morning. Um, Miss Amanda Brooke Lyons. Anybody want to come on down, Peyton? Get this for your sister. All right, while she's coming, Peyton, you can come and get your own, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so both of them. Um, so we've got Jonathan and Bailey here. All right, let's give them a, a round of applause and congratulations. <laughs> and we appreciate all of our graduates, whether high school or college, and congratulations to you all. All right, and then again, like I said, the Hutchins went to Courtney Wagner this year. All right. All right, I would like to now, uh, uh, let's see, first of all, I want to uh, express my appreciation, first of all, to you. Um, I was thinking yesterday and I just, this had still blessed my heart, but the way that you showed your love and demonstrated your love for my wife and I during the time of her dad's illness. And many of you have been asking about him. Uh, We talked to him, uh, Susan did, talked to him yesterday and he is gaining a little bit of strength, but then uh, he'll lose a little bit. And uh, he's very limited in what he can do, but he's doing so much better than than what he was doing when, when we were out there. And he's doing, he's doing physical therapy, right? And he is, uh, that's helping a lot. And uh, we really appreciate your prayers through all that. And it's, thank you once again so much for the, the uh, financial assistance in going out there. Uh, we love you all so much and appreciate you more than you'll ever know. And um, just really thank the Lord for you. Our choir now would like to sing for you and Tracy, uh, 
Uh, come on down, Tracy. And we're going to do Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. And I love what uh, Mr. Chris Tomlin has done to this awesome hymn. Um, there are lots of things. If you will listen to your contemporary radio stations today, there are so many uh, new songs coming out that, are, that have actually taken our hymns and are uh, rearranging our hymns and using the words of these composers of uh, all these years and the, uh, uh, the God-gifted talents that they have putting music with these uh, awesome words. And uh, it's really neat to hear what, uh, how some of our hymns are being arranged today. But this is one of my favorite arrangements of this hymn uh, this, this added on chorus, my chains are gone because of God's amazing grace. You. Yeah. 
Uh, let's continue as we sing hymn number 140 this morning, Down at the Cross, and we will do the first and the first, second, and the last stanzas, and this will be our offertory hymn this morning. And again, I'm going to ask if you would just stand, please, as we sing. Number 140, first, second, and last stanzas, Down at the Cross. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood applied, glory to His name. I'm going to ask you if you would to lead us once again as we pray, please. If you would to join me as we sing this little awesome chorus, Here I Am to Worship. You know, we often start the worship service off with that, but it's got such a message that it can be put anywhere in the worship service because anywhere, anytime, we can have one-on-one -on -one worship with the Lord. And it's that's just an awesome, amazing opportunity that the Lord has given us because of his great love for us, that we can come to him anytime and we can worship him. So let's worship him today uh, as we sing these few choruses. They're familiar choruses. Words are on the screen. Just sing along with me. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see Beauty that made this heart adore you Hope of a life spent with you So here I am to worship Here I am to bow down here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. King of all days, King of all days, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Only you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake became Here I am to bow down Here I 
is our God. Let's do that one more time. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. this chorus. Sing this with me. Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners. Ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. Let's do it again. Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer. Rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all, Jesus Messiah. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. One more time, ready? Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. Bless the holy name. Sing on. Sing like Father, I thank you for these choruses that just help us to focus on you and worship you and the hymns. Lord, I just thank you for music. Lord, that just sets the stage and helps set the atmosphere for worship. Lord, I, I pray now that you will 
bless the reading and the proclamation of your word. I pray that you will help me to communicate your heart to your people. And I thank you for it now. Give us all ears to hear and hearts to receive the word of God, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's open our Bibles to John's Gospel, chapter 5. John, chapter 5. I have been giving a lot of thought to our church and where we are as a church, uh, where uh, we seem to be going as a church, what I believe that God is doing in and through us. And uh, this past week as I prayed and um, asked the Lord to give me something to share with you this morning, I think that this message is perhaps... Um, preparation for uh, next Sunday's vote. And so I hope that you will listen attentively, and I hope and pray that God will minister to your heart. What I'm about to share with you is will be considered by some as elementary, uh, just some basic uh, thoughts, that things that we already know, perhaps, uh, but perhaps things that we have a tendency to forget. We don't talk about a lot, so I just trust that God will use his word today and speak to us. So let's look at this passage in John chapter 5. And if you, uh, for your information, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says that the Jews were having a feast in Jerusalem. And so Jesus made his way to Jerusalem. And when he entered the city, he saw a man there, verse 5, that had an infirmity 38 years. And uh, Jesus healed the man the Bible says there in in verse 8 that Jesus said unto him rise take up thy bed and walk and immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked and on the same day was the Sabbath in other words Jesus healed this man on the Sabbath now the Bible tells us that as a result of that the Jews uh, who were there and who saw what happened uh, the Jews got angry with Jesus look at verse 16 and therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus, and they sought to slay him. In other words, they were so angry with Jesus because he had healed on the Sabbath day that they wanted to kill him. And it says very clearly there in verse 16, and therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. And so Jesus, in order to justify himself, what did he do? The Bible tells us in the very next verse that Jesus pointed to the work of God as a justification for his Sabbath day activity. Look at what he told them. He says in verse 17, But Jesus answered them, said, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Notice that. He says, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. And so this morning, what I want to do, I want us to focus on God's work. God's work and I want us to see four things this morning regarding God's work now when Jesus used that word work if there it in the Greek it means to toil it means that he was busy at a task or an occupation etc by implication it means that he was engaged in or with someone he was engaged in his divine activity and so he's saying that God is working and what Jesus was saying is God is working and so let's look at four things this morning first of all I want you to understand that God's work is continuous God's work is continuous Jesus when he said God my father worketh he was implying that God the father is always at work there is never a time when God the father will cease from his working in out his divine plan for this world. He is attentive to what is going on. He never sleeps, nor does he slumber. Uh, he is constantly uh, looking at and watching over his entire creation, and he never neglects what is going on. And so God's work is continuous, and I'm going to come back to this at the close of the message this morning. So number one, God's work is continuous. Number two, I want you to notice that God's work has purpose. Let me put it another way. 
Everything that God does, He does for a reason. He has a purpose behind every single thing He does. And you say, well, what is God's purpose? If He is working and God is working continuously, then, then what is God's purpose? Well, I believe just to sum it up in one nutshell, put it in one nutshell, I could sum it up this way. God has a plan and a will for humanity and for this world. He has a divine plan and will for mankind. And His plan, listen to this, God's plan and will is to enlarge His kingdom. You say, what do you mean? I mean that God has a plan to bring as many souls as possible into his kingdom. He has a desire to save souls and to bring souls into his kingdom so that in turn those souls can take uh, what God teaches them and commands them and goes out and they're winning more and more and more people enlarging his kingdom. The Bible tells us that God certainly has a kingdom. It is a spiritual kingdom. We oftentimes we cannot see all of God's activity in that kingdom, but we know that God's work is going on, that His work is a continuous work, and His work always has a divine purpose behind it. God is at work right now in your life, whether you realize it or not. You may be here this morning lost without Jesus. You've never been saved and born again. I want you to understand God's great desire for your life is that you come to know Jesus as your personal Savior. God desires to have a relationship with every single person. He does not want one to perish. No, not one. And whether you realize God's activity and His work going on in your life or not, God is busy. He is at work doing what He can do to draw you to Himself and help you to understand your great need of Jesus. Christ his son who is by the way the only way of eternal redemption and eternal salvation and so God's work is continuous and God's work has a has a purpose and that purpose is to grow his kingdom now it's interesting that we find out how God does that he does that through number one through his son God the father sent Jesus Christ the son of this world to be the man's redeemer you know as well as I do, and I hope everyone here knows and understands this, that our forefather Adam sinned, willfully sinned against God in the Garden of Eden. And the moment that man sinned against God, man became a sinner. And that sin passed down upon all men, for now all men are sinners. And sin separates a man from God. It separates a person from God. And so God had to do something in order to bring man back into a right relationship with himself. Because you see, in, in the beginning, it was not man that was lost. Really, it was the relationship that was lost. When man sinned, before man sinned, he had a relationship with God the Father. The Bible says that God would come down and, and converse with Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve would converse with God. God would take care of them. God put them in a, in a uh, um, in, was, they were in a stage of innocence, and he put them in a perfect environment. But when sin entered the world, then something, listen, tragic happened, and that is that sin passed down upon all men, and again, because all men had become sinners in the eyes of God, so that all men need redemption, all men need salvation. And so God the Father did something awesome. He sent Jesus Christ, his Son of the world, to become the Savior of the world and to redeem mankind from the world. And so Jesus went to the cross. He or took upon himself human flesh. He lived a perfect life, went to the cross, and died for our sins on that cross, paid our sin debt in full, took the punishment for our sin, was died, was buried, and rose again the third day, and lives forever to make intercession for us at the right hand of the Father, which is in heaven. Now, through the Son, Jesus Christ, God wants to redeem all lost humanity. Does that mean that all men will be saved? Absolutely not, because not all men will be saved, according to Jesus in Matthew chapter 7. But we do know that God has a desire that not one perish, no, not one. And so, through God's Son, God devised this plan uh, in which man could be redeemed. And now, not only comes through His Son, but it comes through the, the spiritual birth, the new birth. Jesus said, unless you're born again or born from above, you'll never see the kingdom of God. You'll never enter into the kingdom of God. And so through Jesus Christ, uh, the Son of Almighty God, who paid our sin debt in full and shed His blood for us, through that shed blood we find redemption and we find forgiveness of our sin when we put our faith and trust in Him and His finished work on the cross for us. But that come, And when that happens, we are born from above. The Bible says we not only need to be born, or we, once we're born physically, it says we need to be born spiritually. We need to, we be, we're born of the flesh, but we must also be born of the Spirit in order to enter into the kingdom of God. 
And so God devised this plan and he put it together through his son and through the spiritual new birth. And then when people are born from above, now get listen to this now. When people are saved and they're born by the Spirit and the power of Almighty God, God takes them and enlists them in his activity, in his work. He expects every single child of God to engage in his activity so that he can use them to reach a lost and a dying world. And you and I, as Christ followers, become, listen, we become ambassadors for Christ. We become, listen, we, get, we engage in his activity and we join him hand in hand. I want you to listen to something in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and in verse 14. Now, uh, please listen carefully because I'm going somewhere with this at the end uh, as I conclude this message and I'm going to apply it to us today and where we are as a church. But listen to this. Paul is writing to the church at Corinth in chapter 5 beginning in verse 1. He's writing about the things that compelled him to be the person, the missionary that he was for Jesus Christ. And one of the things that he said that compelled him to be this great missionary and to be faithful to Christ uh, is truly the judgment seat of Christ. He says that there in verse 10. But then he goes on down in verse 14 and he talks about the love of Christ also constrained him and, and made him the kind of person that he was. Now listen, let's pick up and begin reading in verse 14. He says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, and he's not only referring to himself, but also to those who ministered with him and to those to whom he was writing and to us today. It's, a, it's relevant for those of us today. It says, For the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, which he's referring to Jesus and how he died for all men, he said, Then we're all dead. And that he, Christ, died for all, that they which live, watch this now, should not henceforth live unto themselves. That means that when we were saved and born again, we were bought with a price through the blood of Jesus Christ, and our body and our spirit becomes God's. And we're no longer our own. And he says, he said, we should not henceforth live unto ourselves, but live unto him who is God, or Jesus, which died for us and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now listen to this, verse 18. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us, that is, all of those who have become Christians and have trusted Christ as their Savior through the shed blood of Jesus, and the new birth, we have been reconciled to God. It says, And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath, watch this, and hath given us, all of those who have been born again, hath given us the ministry of reconciliation. So the Bible says that God saved us for a purpose. His whole divine plan is to enlarge his kingdom by saving souls and then engaging those souls in his divine activity to engage more souls in, in salvation and in that divine activity so that he can enlarge his kingdom and reach as many people and souls as he can before Jesus Christ comes back. And so that is his whole purpose. And he goes on to say here that we have been given the ministry of reconciliation as members of the body of Christ. Now listen to this, verse 19. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us those who are saved and born again the word of reconciliation. So now then, the Bible says very clearly that you and I as Christ followers who have been born again by the Spirit of God, we have not only been given the ministry of reconciliation, but we have been given the word of reconciliation so that we are to go out and to win others and see that they're reconciled to God. So we join hand in hand with God to engage in his divine activity so that he can enlarge his kingdom. He says, now then, verse 20, 
We are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God, for he hath made him, Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so God has a plan. And his plan is to enlarge his kingdom. He does that through Jesus Christ, his son, and through the new birth experience. He does that by once people are born again and saved, he accomplishes, listen, his work in and through people. Listen, God accomplishes his work through human instruments. He could have chosen angels, and certainly he uses angels to accomplish his work. But God has so chosen human beings, those who will come to the saving faith of Jesus Christ, he has chosen us to be his ambassadors and to go about doing his work and his will. Now, he does that by, first of all, working in man. God works in man. You say, what do you mean? I mean he works in a man. He draws a man by his Holy Spirit in the, uh, as he initiates the process uh, of salvation. He draws us by his Spirit, John 6, and verse 65. Uh, the Bible says that God convicts of sin, righteousness, and judgment through the Holy Spirit. That that's, is that inward conviction. That's in John 16, 8. And then the Bible says that God continues this work in the believer. Listen to what he says in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. Paul wrote this, and he says, being confident of this very thing. In other words, this was something that Paul said, I have no doubt about this. I am very confident about this. He says, being confident of this very thing, that he, God, which hath begun a good work in you. So he's saying God initiated the good work that is in you and me. He says, this God, God himself, hath begun a good work in you. That same God will perform, will continue that work in you until the day of Jesus Christ. What's the day of Jesus Christ? It's the day when Jesus returns to this earth. And so that's, it goes right back to what I said in the very beginning. God's work is continuous. He never stops working. And so that means, my dear brethren, that if you're here this morning and you're saved and born again, God is working in your life. God is working on your life. And so God works in us to bring us to salvation and to bring us to himself so that we can have a relationship with him. And then God conforms us. Listen, he works in us to conform us into the very image of Christ. In, in Romans chapter 8 and verse 29, Jesus said this, that God predestined that those who come to Christ be conformed to the very image of Jesus Christ his son so that when we, go, when we engage in God's activity, then we, listen, we won't be hypocrites. We'll look like Jesus, talk like Jesus, act like Jesus. They'll see Jesus in us so that when we go out and we witness for the Lord Jesus Christ, then, then listen, people won't think that we're some hypocrite. But we will talk the talk and walk the walk. We will be what we're supposed to be. And so God does that work in us. But not only does God work in us, God works through us. God works through us. You see, God chose to use human instruments. God works through us to evangelize and to minister the word of Almighty God to a lost and a dying world. He chose us to, to evangelize us and to save us and to bring us into a relationship with himself, not only that we can evangelize others, but so that we can minister to others, minister to one another in the body of Christ, minister to those in the world who are hurting. And believe me, there are a lot of people in the world that are hurting today. But God has chosen to use us. And then... Not only does God work in us, and not only does he work through us, but God works around us. God works around us. You say, what do you mean? I mean that God is involved and his, he is engaged in his divine activity even today. God is working. He's working all around us to accomplish this divine plan. And he orchestrates all of these things in us and through us and around us. He orchestrates all of these things to fulfill his divine purpose for the individual lives of his children, for the life of his church, and for the life of this world. And so all of that is his purpose. And you know what? There's a final purpose, part of his purpose that I haven't mentioned. That is, all of this will bring glory to him. Jesus said in, in uh, Matthew chapter 5, he, said, I, he told his disciples, he said, I want you to be the light of the world. He said, you're the salt of the earth. But he said, I want you to be the light of the world. I want you to be salt and light in a world of darkness. I want you to be a good and godly influence in a, in a world that is dying. 
I, I want you to set your, heel, your light on a hillside. He said, I don't want you to put your light under a bushel where people can't see it, but I want you to set your light on a hill, and I want you to shine brightly throughout the world. And he says, if you will shine brightly and the world see your good works, then what will happen? What will be the end result? It will bring glory to the Father. And so we're here to bring glory to him through this work that we're engaged in as we join hands with God. And so I want you to understand that the God's work is continuous and God's work has purpose. But thirdly, now listen to this. This is important. God's work has God-sized dimensions. Not only is God's work continuous and not only does his work have purpose, but God's work has God-sized dimensions. You say, well, what do you mean? I don't quite understand what, you, what you're saying here. What I mean by that is simply this, that when God saves us, oftentimes he calls us to do things that, listen, things that are humanly impossible for us to do apart from him. And when they are done through us, then he receives glory. Let me give you some examples. I want you to think about some Old Testament examples. I want you to think about Gideon. Do you remember uh, the story about Gideon? And the Bible tells us that, that the joint forces of the Midianites and, and the Amalekites and other eastern peoples were prepared to attack Gideon and his army. And the Bible tells us that Gideon started with 32,000 men. Are you listening? Gideon started with his army. He had an army of 32,000 men. But when God came to Gideon and told him, said, Gideon, listen, I want you to, to, to send 31,700 of those men home. I want you to send them home because I'm going to win this battle. I'm going to win this victory through 300 men. Can you imagine what Gideon thought? Can you imagine what came through his mind? I mean, th this was a crisis for him. To, to think that, Lord, what do you mean you're gonna, you want me to send 31,700 of my men home and you're going to win this battle against this huge army with only 300 men? God said, yes, that's what I want to do. And you know what? When the victory was won, you know what happened? Everyone knew that it was God that won the battle. It wasn't Gideon and it wasn't the 300 men. It was God that won the battle. I think about David. I think about David as he went up against that giant of a man, Goliath. Can you imagine what David must have thought? Uh, even Saul thought it. I mean, he went and Saul, listen, David was, you remember the story, Saul and his army were encamped against the Philistines. And the Philistines sent this giant of a man out to taunt Israel for 40 days and 40 nights. And this big dude came out, giant-sized man came out with all of his armor and all this stuff on. He was a professional warrior. He came out and no one would, was willing to go and to fight against Goliath. But young David, little bitty lad boy, ruddy guy, he comes up and he tells Saul, he said, listen, I hear this giant of a man, I hear him taunting Israel. He says, I, I will go and I will fight. So Saul tries to put his own armor on young David. And David said, no, I can't fight this battle in this armor. I will go in the might and the power of God. And he reminded Saul of something that happened in his life prior to coming to where he was. He said, I fought a lion and I fought a bear. And he said, the same God that gave me victory over them will give me victory over this giant. And David went out and he took that sling in hand and five smooth stones, the Bible said. And he took one of those stones and put it in that sling and he began to sling that sling. And man, when he turned you loose of that sling that that uh, that rock that stone that smooth stone went straight to the forehead of, of Goliath the giant and it knocked him down and the Bible says that David took Goliath's sword and cut his head off when that victory was won everyone standing around that knew and everyone that heard believed that God had won the battle I think about Joshua. I think about Joshua when God told Joshua, he said, Joshua, I want you to go and I want you to march around, walk around this city and blow some trumpets, and when you do, the wall's going to fall and come tumbling down. All of you know the story. How unreasonable that sounded to Gideon. 300 men? How unreasonable it was for David. And how unreasonable it was for Joshua. You see, oftentimes these God-sized dimensional things that God will ask us to do seem humanly impossible and will seem, listen, seem unreasonable. But God is good at that. 
God calls his people to engage in his activity, and when he does, God gives those God-sized dimensional assignments that only he can accomplish through someone, through his own power. Now, what happens to a person who's given a God-sized assignment? And this God-sized assignment, it has God-sized dimensions to it. What happens to a person? Well, simply put, when a man is invited to join God in his activity and, and comes in a relationship with God and God gives him that invitation to come in and to join him and to engage in his activity, you know, Henry Blackaby calls it the crisis of belief. An individual enters into what he refers to as a crisis of belief. And that is, that is a turning point where the believer must make a major decision about God. Are you listening? Are you not asleep on me, are you? This is going to come home in just a moment. But a, a person must, must decide what he or she believes about God. I, I, is God able? Is God worthy to trust? Is he willing? Can God do this through me? Can God do this awesome task through us? I mean, I'm sure that Gideon and Joshua and Abraham and David and all the others that we read about in Scripture, I'm sure that every single one of them had that thought. But every single one of them had to come to a crisis of belief in their life. And they, it was a turning point in their life and in their ministry. And they had to come to that crisis of belief and they had to make up their mind what they truly believed about God. And how, listen to this, how they responded at that crisis of belief revealed what they did believe about God. You say, well, what are some of the essentials? I mean, what, what's important for us to... To have in our life if we're going to pass this test and we're going to be willing as individuals and as a, as a body of believers to pass whatever test God may have for us and whatever God-sized dimensional type thing He may put in our path. What, well, let me just mention a few. Number one is faith. We're going to have to have faith. And what is faith? Well, the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 11 and in verse 1, He gives us a definition of faith. And he says, faith is the substance, listen to this now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, I love what Ryrie says, and I want to I share with you what he says. He says, faith is described in this great verse as the substance, that is the assurance or reality of things hoped for and the evidence or proof of things not seen. Faith gives reality and proof of things unseen, treating them as if they were already objects of sight rather than of hope. This, this corresponds perfectly with what Jesus told his disciples. When Jesus had walked by a fig tree and wanted to gather some figs off of a fig tree, he found none. And Jesus cursed the fig tree. And the disciples saw and heard that. And so the next day, and he told them, he sold the fig tree. He said, they won't any more fruit grow on you, and you're going to dry up. And so the next day, they came along and came by that same fig tree. And guess what? It was dead as a doornail. It had dried up from the roots, and the disciples couldn't get over it. They said, how in the world can you do this? And I'm paraphrasing here. But they said, how in the world could you do this? And Jesus taught them a lesson about faith. And he said, you must believe. You must have faith. And he goes on to say that when you pray, you must pray in faith, believing that what you're asking for has already happened. It's already on the way. That's what faith is. And so we must have faith, but then there must be trust, and trust goes along with faith. And what is trust? Well, just a simple definition of trust. Trust is the reliance on, listen to this, the, listen, the integrity, the strength, and the ability of a person or thing. So if we're trusting God, that means that we trust his person. We trust that he is a person of integrity. We trust that he is a person of power and strength. We trust that he is a person of ability, that he can do anything. The Bible says that nothing is impossible with God. Did you hear that? Nothing, my dear brethren, is impossible with God. Absolutely nothing. And so God is a big God and God is a great God. But there must be faith and trust. Secondly, there must be action. Because James tells us in the book of James, in James 2.26, that faith without works is dead. 
If a man say that he have faith but he has no works, that's dead faith. It's not an active faith. And so when we say we have faith, there must be some action taken on that faith as a result of that faith and so that we'll step out and do whatever it is God is challenging us or calling us to do. And then there must be a willingness, listen to this, thirdly, there must be a willingness to make adjustments. When God puts something before us, whether as individual members of the body of Christ or whether it is the body, the whole church itself, when God puts something before us, He will always require us to make adjustments. Not only does it require us to have faith and trust in Him, but it's going to require us to make adjustments in our life. And that is another turning point in the believer's life. Not only the crisis of belief, do I believe that God is who He says He is and He will do what He says He will do, and he's, but, and he's a person of integrity, strength, and ability. But hey, am I willing to make whatever adjustments that I need to make in order to follow God? A lot of people aren't. And do you understand that a lot of people miss God's best but th because they're not willing to make whatever adjustments that God is requiring them to make in that process? And then there's another thing that, that is essential, and that is sacrifice. Sacrifice. Every one of the men that I, I shared about earlier, Gideon and Joshua and David, Abraham, they all had to sacrifice something. The Christian life is a life of sacrifice. God and Father sacrificed His best for you and me. He sacrificed His only begotten Son. Jesus Christ sacrificed His best. He gave up His all, His life. His, he shed His blood for us. What are we giving up for Him? Let's face it, oftentimes we become very selfish and self-centered. And, and we're not willing to sacrifice. But if we're willing to go on with God, in order to go with God, listen to this. Henry Blackaby says this. He says, you can never stay where you are and go with God because God is constantly moving. You can never remain as you are and go with God because God is constantly changing. He's cha not changing himself. He doesn't change. He never changes. But he's constantly changing things. He's changing his people and, and conforming them in the very image of Christ. That alone denotes change. And so we, we must be willing to make whatever adjustments we need to make and to make whatever sacrifice that God may call on us to make. I'll never forget when God called me to the ministry. I have, had a nice home. I had an acre of property that that home was on. And God led me, a year after I went into the ministry, He led me to, to sell my home and my land. Man, I had worked hard for that. Matter of fact, the day that I sold it, I paid the property off. I only owed three years on my home. Three years on my home. And I'm not saying this bragging in any way. I'm just telling you what God oftentimes will require of us. But God said, I want you to get rid of all this. I don't want you to be tied down. I want you to be able to go when I say go and go where I say go. And I don't want you to have to be worried about this, that, and the other. I even found out later on that our insurance wouldn't even cover it. If, we, if a tornado had come through and blown our house down or if a fire, our insurance wouldn't have cut it with us not living in it. And so God led me to sell my home. And I prayed and, and I, that, was a, that was a sacrifice that I made at the very outset of my ministry many, many years ago. Do I regret that? Absolutely not. I don't. I don't have any regrets about that. We don't have anything. My wife and I have one automobile that's paid for. We're making lease notes on the other, and we have a few old pieces of worn-out furniture, and that is it. But you know what? We're perfectly happy. I just believe somehow God's going to provide, and that was his promise to me that he was going to provide. So I'm telling you, when God calls us, he asks us oftentimes to sacrifice things. And then finally, we must be obedient. Now, the final thing I want you to see this morning is this. Remember what I've said. Number one, as we think about God's work in this world, number one, His work is continuous. He never stops working. God is always working. Jesus said this, My Father worketh, hitherto I work. I join with Him in the work. Not only is work continuous, but His work has purpose. To bring as many as possible into the kingdom of God, and he's chosen to use his son and the new birth experience and those whom he chooses to, he, he saves 
to bring them into a relationship with themselves so that they in turn can go out and engage in God's activity and win more. And then when they, we do go out and engage in God's activity, oftentimes they, that activity has God-sized dimensions. God-sized dimensions, which brings us to a point or a crisis of belief, which is a turning point in our life, in our ministry, where we have to decide what we're going to do or what we believe about God and what we're going to do. Now, to bring that home to where we are right here today, the final thing I want to mention this morning is this, that God's work continues right here. You say, what do you mean? Well, I, 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 I'll tell you like I told the first church crowd this morning. If you cannot see God's activity at work around you in Pleasant Hill Baptist Church, you are blind. You're just blind. You don't want to see it. Because God is still working. This morning, a couple that has, they've been coming here, I know, three or four or five years. They joined this morning. I've got six in Next Steps class right now. God is constantly bringing you people here every week. Listen, and we can't take any credit for any of this. This is all a God thing. It's all God. It's not us. We've got to, we've got to create an atmosphere and a spirit of oneness and unity and love and joy. And Certainly, that, that, that's going to help. But this is all a God thing. But God is at work. He's doing His work. He continues to draw people here, and He continues to add members to this body people who are joining, and those members are getting engaged in God's activity. I'm sitting here looking at some of you young people, some of you people who have joined this church in the last few months or the last year, and you have come into this body and you have gotten engaged in God's activity because you believe that's what God would have you to do. And as a result of people coming into this body and getting engaged in God's activity and the numerical growth that we have, that is going to require us, number one, to enlarge our organization. I mean, you can't get around this, folks. Are you listening to me? Please listen to me. We cannot get around the fact that the larger we grow numerically, the larger our organization must become. That means we're going to have to put on more staff people. It means we're going to have to have more volunteer help to do everything that needs to be done. And listen to this. I want you to know as your pastor, I still have a great vision for this church, and I believe that we are on the brink. Listen to me. I believe that we are on the brink of going to another level. I really do. I have some plans for the near future, and as you know, I give an annual report to you every year. I'll be sharing in that report this year, about September, October. I'll be sharing with you what my plans are to help reach, get us to another level with God's help. And I can't do this alone. You must cooperate with me. We must have the staff. We must have the finances. We must have all that we need to do what God is calling us to do. But as a result of all the activity that God has been involved in here in this place and the numerical growth that we have, we must enlarge, uh, enlarge our organization and we must also, uh, listen, make accommodations for that growth so that we can accommodate the growth that we've had in our facilities. And so uh, over a year ago, we put together a vision team. That vision team has been working diligently uh, and prayerfully uh, to put together a master plan for our church that will help accommodate the growth, that numerical growth that we're having now and will help in the future. And so the vision team has done their work. And they, the architects have already come and presented their plan. Most of you, I hope all of you who are here, have seen that plan and have heard that plan. Uh, they will be back this next Wednesday evening to have a Q&A period where you can ask any questions you want and they will give you, hopefully give you the answers that maybe you don't want to hear, but they're going to give you answers to your questions. And so we've gone through this whole process. And you know what? Here is where we are as a church right now. Are you listening? Say amen. Here's where we are as a church right now. We are at the crisis of belief. Our church is at the crisis of belief. God has given us a God-sized assignment. And we are at a crisis of belief. And my question to you is this. What do you believe, what do you truly believe about God? Is He able? Is He willing? Is He involved? Will He come through? Is He trustworthy? Is he a God of integrity? Will he let us fail? I mean, all of these questions are questions that we must ask ourselves. Because when we fall into the crisis of belief, that's when the rubber meets the road. 
And that's when every single person in this body must decide what they truly believe about God. So as we look at this assignment, and we see we, there, there are things that is required of us, those things I just mentioned, faith and trust, action, adjustment, sacrifice and obedience, all of those things must come into play. And here's the bottom line. And I'm going to close with this. Are you listening? Listen carefully. Here's the bottom line. How you and I respond next Sunday morning when we vote will be what we truly believe about this God that we claim that we know and serve. The vote that you cast as a, to as a body, whatever that vote is, that is going to, going to reveal what we truly believe about the God that we know and that we serve. And so I want you to think about what you've heard today, all this next week. I want you to come Wednesday night to the Q&A. Ask your questions. Get your answers. And I want you to pray, 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 pray. We look at this assignment. We look at this project. And the first thing that people want to see is $2.5 million for the first phase. $2.5 million is a lot of money. That's a lot of money. And we sit back and we think, there's no way we can do this. You're absolutely right. There's no way we can do this. But if this is God's will, God will provide the way. God will make the way. God will provide the finances we need to make the payments or to do whatever. He could pay it off in one day. Charles Stanley, I watched him one night. I, I always watch him. You know, he's sort of been a mentor to me. And They needed the in-touch building, building for the in-touch ministries. This happened years ago. He and some of the staff went off in the mountains to, and, and, or somewhere off on a retreat, and they prayed and fasted. They came down off of that retreat, and he went to his office and found a piece of paper on his desk. He said, you need to call this certain man in Dallas, Texas. He didn't know who the man was. Didn't know who he was, but he called them the number, and the man told him, said, Dr. Stanley, I, I've been, uh, been watching your ministry for a long time. And he said, I believe it's, it's worth an investment. He said, what, what, uh, what is it that you need? What is your greatest need right now? And he said, well, to be very honest with you, we need a building for our in-touch ministries. He said, well, have you picked out a building? Dr. Stanley said, yes, we picked out a building. He said, well, how much does it cost? He said, a million dollars. He said, I'm writing the check out right now. One million dollars, just like that. You said, Psst, that's Charles Stanley. That's First Baptist Church at Atlanta, Georgia. We serve the same God. God has all the money that we need. It's just a matter of God doing his work. And we'd be surprised where some of that money will come from. People like you and me who will be willing to reach deep down and sacrifice. Our forefathers, the forefathers of this church, as y'all have already been told, if you were here, you saw the presentation. Forefathers of this church sacrificed. Many of them went to the bank and mortgaged their homes off to get the money to build the building that you are enjoying right here this morning sacrifice anything that's worth anything will require sacrifice the freedom that you and I enjoy this morning sacrifice many lives have been taken to ensure the freedom of this nation. Are we willing? God is able. Let's pray. Father, this morning we stand amazed at what you've done in and through our forefathers. Not only those we know, but 
those that we read about in Scripture. We stand in awe of your activity as we think about what you've done here in and among us and what you continue to do. I pray that you will not stop doing what you're doing and I, I pray that you will help us to be good stewards of all of those that you're sending our way that we can disciple them and engage them in the work of the ministry. Lord, I pray that you will be with our church and next Sunday morning if Jesus tarries and nothing happens, I pray that when the church casts its vote on this master plan, that you will speak clearly through your people, your will for this project. We don't have the money. We don't have the means. But we know the person that can provide everything we need. That is Jehovah God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that you are our God. We praise you for who you are, for what you are doing, for what you continue to do, and for what I believe you will do in the future. I thank you for loving us, and I thank you for life through Jesus, your Son. Father, if there's someone here today that's not saved and they don't know Jesus. How I pray your Holy Spirit will convict them of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. And they'll give their heart and life to Jesus right here today. They'll put their faith and trust in the person of Jesus and in the finished work of Jesus on the cross for them. He'll believe, they'll believe in, in his life, his, his perfect life, his, his death on the cross on their behalf and his, res, his death and burial and resurrection. And Lord, they'll surrender their life and commit their life to Jesus today. And I pray that you will be with every Christian that's here. Challenge every heart. And move on us. To help us to know your will. And I thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.